Welcome back to CST 302, Introduction to Christian Thought. Um, as we are closing the course together, we certainly want to look ahead at uh, the new creation. And so uh, this will be one of your final, one of the last of the video lectures you'll see, but it deals with end things. And so that obviously would be appropriate uh, by that title. So looking at the destiny of the cosmos in worldview perspective, but primarily from our Christian perspective, as we've been looking at uh, throughout this whole course, the Christian view or Christian worldview, uh, and according to Orthodox Christianity. So the biblical storyline and the Christian worldview deal with, as we have already discussed, and if you remember many weeks ago reading about uh, the creation, the fall, the redemption, and then the new creation or consummation um, that uh, was spelled out all the way back in our in the beginning, and and we looked at all that in Riken's book. But that basically is is the purpose of this lecture, looking towards the end things, the new creation, the consummation of all things as we know it. And so this new creation is something that even many centuries ago was foretold uh, by God's prophets um, at a just before 600 BC, um, or just after 600 BC, excuse me, the uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah began prophesying or foretelling of a day when all of God's kingdom promises would be realized. And so that's what we have written there. And that's called a prophetic eschatology. Eschatology is the study of end times. And that prophetic eschatology is that end times vision that we see particularly in Isaiah and Jeremiah. A lot of people like to focus on Daniel as well in the apocalyptic literature there that's similar to much of the book of Revelation. But here we're looking at it just as the consummation of all that God began and all that God has accomplished um, specifically through Jesus Christ. And so there are several elements that are involved in this uh, prophetic eschatology. And um, they deal with a new people of God. Originally, God chose an ethnic group of people from uh, Abraham's uh, lineage that were known as the Israelites. Uh, but we know now that through Christ, your ethnicity has nothing to do with whether you're a child of God or not. It's all the redemption that comes through Jesus Christ. And so there's a new people of God um, that includes the Gentile nations or all nations ethnically. And then there's the new temple, a new temple that symbolically represents God's presence. In the Old Testament, the temple, um, and even prior to the temple, the, the synagogue and the tent of meeting, those represented the specific presence of God among his people. Well, we know, according to the New Testament, that the Holy Spirit giving to, given to those who have come into a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ represent or have within them the presence of God, as the Apostle Paul reminds the Corinthian church um, that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And then there's a new covenant. And unlike the old covenant or the Old Testament, this one is written on the hearts of God's people. Um, that was even prophesied centuries before Christ came. In comparison to the Old Covenant, or the law that literally was written um, in stone, um, now our hearts that are regenerated and renewed um, have the capacity to know of God's law, what God requires of us, and, and that personal relationship with him. And then ultimately, a new heavens and a new earth. Um, the curse that came, if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, the curse that came upon not only the man and the woman, but on all of creation and the created order will be undone and the cosmos, the created world as we know it, will be restored. In fact, the book of Romans in Romans chapter 8 says the creation longs for, it desires uh, that restoration. And so um, that's what the prophetic eschatology was dealing with. And all of this takes place by means of two future events that are related to one another. And that's the coming of God and the coming of the Messiah. And we see those things fulfilled of God coming to his people, the Lord of Zion, and the prophet, priest, and king, which we've already talked about, being anointed and crowned with glory, as the book of Hebrews 
says in Hebrews chapter 2 that Jesus, because of the death that he suffered and died uh, for our sin, uh, he was crowned with glory and honor. And so all of that takes place as it was foretold even centuries before. God's had a plan. God's made himself known throughout the uh, working of his plan, and he has let us know what we need to know in order to or in order to allow us to be a part of his plan. That's part of the goodness and grace of God, um, that there, there really are no secrets when it comes to the things that we need to know. There are things we'll never know, but we're not God. And even if he were to tell us, there would be things he would could communicate that we would never understand because of our limited capacity here. But all that we need to know, and even more, has been revealed to us. And so we see this new creation inaugurated in Christ. So from the perspective of the New Testament or the new covenant, as Jesus called it, Jesus just before his death um, said, in my blood, this new covenant is being uh, brought about, this New Testament. And the book of Hebrews explains that uh, the superiority of Christ um, is far greater than even the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. But all of these kingdom promises have been inaugurated in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's foundational to Christianity. That's what distinguishes Christianity from every other faith system, that based upon the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has uh, made known and fulfilled all that he has attended and intended. And the Gospels tell this story in the incarnation of Christ, which is um, God becoming a human being born through the Virgin Mary, uh, but still being God and man. We've talked about that um, already. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. Um, he, uh, he, uh, he expressed or revealed the miracles, the supernatural work of God in and through his ministry while he was uh, here on earth. And then even his teaching was that which, as the uh, gospel accounts tell us, even the most educated couldn't understand how can someone who was not educated teach with such authority. Well, it's because he was God, and we know that looking back. Then the sacrificial death of Christ, that Christ willingly surrendered to go to the cross to pay for our wrong and the curse as a result of sin. The book of Galatians says that he became a curse for us. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So he allowed himself to be nailed to that cross to hang on the proverbial tree so that he could become that curse, that curse that sin brought on the creation of God. And then, of course, his triumphant resurrection, which is the pinnacle. It's the exclamation point of all that God has done um, revealing the victory of Jesus Christ over sin and death and hell. And then the ascension of Christ in Acts chapter 1, where it's referenced that the apostles saw him descend back into or ascend back into um, heaven. And uh, the book of Hebrews tells us he's seated now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. And so the kingdom of God is portrayed both in a present sense and in a future sense, what sometimes is called the now and not yet, or the um, already and not yet. Christ has already accomplished all that God had planned through his death, burial, and resurrection. That's it. Hebrews chapter 1, the first few verses tell us that long ago God spoke through prophets and in many different ways, but now in these last days, once and for all, he has spoken through his son, Jesus Christ. And so, even though Christ has uh, accomplished all that God had planned, there's a not yet aspect of we're still living in this dimension. And if you ever wonder why, well, why doesn't God just make everything okay and, and we get to the end, his end goal of us spending eternity with him? Well, um, Peter gives us an answer to that in that God is not slow about his promises. Rather, he is patient so that more can come to repentance, so that more can come to know of his goodness and his grace. So it's that already, or that now, we know he has accomplished all that God has planned, but it is not yet fully consummated or fully um, realized and recognized because of God's desire for more people to come to him, to repent and turn to Jesus Christ. That's great news. We should be extremely excited about that. Because God waited long enough for me to know. God waited at least long enough for you to have the opportunity to know. 
And so um, what a great assurance we have there that there are others who are coming to know this great uh, grace of God, this gift and goodness through Jesus Christ. Um, so this new creation is inaugurated in Christ, and, and the story is cast in terms of this new creation. And some of those examples that we see through Scripture would be the Spirit descending upon Jesus at his baptism, as is referenced in Matthew uh, chapter 3. Uh, we see Jesus' miracles um, that overturn the effects of the fall. You know, Jesus healed those, uh, Jesus healed some who were sick. Jesus raised some who had died. Um, Jesus overcame the works of the devil in the, in the lives of, of people who are here on earth. And so he was already revealing that in ushering in this new kingdom of God, that um, it had the ability and now, as we said, is fully accomplished in overturning uh, the, the results of sin and curse and, and even satanic oppression. And then there was the death of Christ where we see, as recorded in the book of Matthew, the temple curtain, which the, was the separation from the priest. And of course, that was even inside where the common man couldn't go, was now ripped open so that we see a picture of our direct access uh, to God and that portrayal of his tearing away that which stood between us and him and uh, providing us direct access to him through what Jesus Christ has accomplished. And then there's the resurrection that takes place and um, the fact that, that Christ rose again and that he rose again so that we may know not only that he's victorious, but that in that victory we share in that because of God's gift to us through him. And that Jews and Gentiles, we mentioned this earlier when we were talking about the, prof, the prophets speaking, who were uh, Jewish, but they were uh, prophesying of a day when, when all the people of God, as the book of Revelation describes, um, a throng of people from, from all nations and tribes and languages uh, will be uh, around the throne of God. And so, again, what a great reason to celebrate, to know that it has nothing to do with me or being born in America or my citizenship here on earth or my ethnicity or anything. It's all by the grace of God, and we can share that with others and let them know that they too can be adopted into the family of God. This new creation then is expressed in the life of the church. The church is the new family, for lack of a better term. So this new creation that brings us as individuals into the adoption of being children of God, we are adopted into a family, which is the church. And after Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, we read um, there in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that he had promised he would give his Holy Spirit so that they would have the power my spirit will come upon you so that you will be empowered to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, to all people, that through his spirit now given to those who are adopted in his family as part of his church, we become that congregation empowered to proclaim the good news about him to the entire world. And you, and you see this as that beginning history book of the church itself throughout the book of Acts. And and some of the incredible um, parallels, just as Adam and Eve were told to be fruitful and multiply in the garden, so to hear now the followers of Christ are empowered and told to be fruitful and multiply. Multiply in the way that you make or are used by God to bring others into the family of God uh, by telling them the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we have the letters, or what's uh, most commonly known as the epistles of the New Testament, that address early churches and early church families of which we can draw principles for faith and life and witness that apply because they are truth, they are God-given truth. They applied to people who were in the first churches 2,000 years ago, just like they apply to us now with, with life-directing, truth-giving principles as to how we live as being a part of this new family or in the church. Um, of God through Jesus Christ. And this new creation is a reality in the lives of believers as we experience new life in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 says, old things are passed away. We are new creatures in Jesus Christ. And so we celebrate as the new creation and the future reality, even though we, we know that all has been accomplished through Christ now, 
there's still a future reality uh, that remains for all of those that are his. And that's what the book of Revelation describes in dealing with some of the events that will take place at the end time when that final consummation takes place, when Christ returns um, to completely establish his kingdom here on this earth. And, and it includes teachings that apply to every church age. Now, there are, there are many differences as to how you can specifically interpret the book of Revelation, and you've seen that in other videos, in other lecture videos of the of the four main ways that Orthodox Christianity views how that takes place. So that's not the focus here. But it's just the reminder of this new creation that's brought about and will be consummated as the kingdom of God is, like we said, not only both now but yet to come. And uh, even though it's already dawned in our lives and in our hearts through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and the spirit-empowered ministry that we have being a part of the family of God in the church of God through Jesus Christ, there's still a, 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 a consummation that awaits and uh, that'll happen at Christ's bodily return to earth. And then that final state will be a restored cosmos, um, a restored created order with resurrected believers in Christ reigning with him um, forever. And as exciting as that is, there's an unfortunate alternative as well that throughout all of eternity, um, there's a place that's specifically described in the New Testament that's called hell. And um, for those who do not turn from their sins and trust and have faith in Jesus Christ, they will spend their eternity there. And uh, so at that point, everyone will have um, arrived at whatever their eternal destination uh, might be. And uh, just again, we, we've talked about some comparisons before, but because we're looking at this from a standpoint of worldviews, um, in the Eastern religions, again, just a reminder of, of the works orientation and how through uh, different cycles of re reincarnation or goodness that's obtained, or again, I, I want to focus on the fact that in these uh, predominant Eastern religions, that there is um, a works aspect. And um, even here in the Western world, um, in modernism, uh, some see an ecological apocalypse that, that we're somehow destroying the earth. And, and I don't doubt, and I know for certain, we're called to be good stewards, just as Adam and Eve were given stewardship over all of the created uh, being that there'll be this eventual collapse and everything's just going to um, all fall apart. Let me assure you, God is in control in spite of how things look and that, that um, we need not fear, no matter how things appear to be, but that we continue to trust in that faith that we have in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And even, even postmoderns who would say, well, there's no way you could know the future. You know, they live in such an uncertainty. When we, who know Jesus Christ, can base our certainty upon who Christ is and what he's done. Yes, if it was all up to me, I would be scared because I know how limited I am in and of myself. But none of it's up to me, and I'm not in control of any of it. I have surrendered by faith and trust to who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for me and allow God then to work everything else out. But in the meantime, as we mentioned a few moments ago, his Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, God himself indwells me that I may let others know that there is a hope. There is a hope in the midst of all the craziness. As the book of Hebrews says, Jesus is our hope as an anchor for our souls. So even in the storms, as the storms of life in this world pass us by, we have an anchor that holds fast in Jesus Christ. And so there is hope, and we have the opportunity to share that hope with others who have no hope. So we can have certainty in an uncertain world, the hope that we have by being new creations in Christ because of our hope being grounded in Christ's work, not anything that I've done or even anything that I deserve. But as a part of his new creation, I'm experiencing now the blessings of peace in the midst of all the conflict and craziness that's going on around me. A presence of hope in the midst of all the craziness where things seem so hopeless. But there will be a final consummation. There will be an end. And um, 
Christ's kingdom is certain uh, through all of that. But it also gives us a purpose in the world in which we live that, that does seem so aimless and at times even pointless. We can know that our surrender to God, our sharing the gospel with others, our serving him joyfully, our, joyfully, our singing his praise, our studying and growing in a maturing and a knowledge of who he is, all these labors do have meaning. And they have meaning not only for us personally, what we benefit from, but they allow us to be sanctified as God's taking us through this process of growth and maturing, but also that our sufferings are meaningful, that uh, even in the midst of suffering, we know that Christ suffered. In fact, the Bible tells us that he learned obedience by suffering. Are we willing, knowing that we're going through this suffering because there is a higher calling, a greater purpose, and a new creation of hope that we have in Jesus Christ and so that our lives are meaningful the lives that we live here now as he has instructed us to go and tell others um, about this hope that we have that that in the world in which we live with that can seem so hopeless we can share that hope with others so I trust that you're encouraged by this I trust that this course has been a, a blessing and a benefit to you um, and I want to encourage you so that I can know how I can improve that if you would just take a few moments and fill out uh, the course evaluation there, um, that would be so helpful not only for me, but for CBU and for future preparation and future courses so that, so that if there's some suggestion you can make as to how we can improve or if you can affirm that which we're already doing so that we know we can make the best use of our resources in sharing the hope of Jesus Christ with others. So please take a few moments and fill out that course evaluation and I would greatly appreciate it if you would do that. I trust God's blessings on you and as always please don't hesitate to contact me if I can be of any help to you as we finish this course together and um, as we continue just to to live in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. God bless you.